It's good to see everybody. Please continue to enjoy your meal. Uh, if you would like more coffee, uh, more food, please feel free to get up and do that, uh, even during the lecture. Um, we are so thankful for the social committee and all that they did to prepare the room. And thankful for everyone bringing such delicious items. It's always a, a great morning when we get to do this each and every year. Uh, we also want to uh, be thankful for uh, Claude H. and Mayor Virginia Moore uh, making this lecture possible annually. Uh, we are so thankful that Bill and Susan, Kent and Marianne and Rachel uh, are all here this morning representing the family. Uh, and we're also excited that this year's lecture uh, gives us a wonderful opportunity to also celebrate uh, this congregation and the 50th anniversary of the ordination of Leland Cooper, uh, which I know many of you uh, in the Moore family and in the congregation remember Leland Cooper uh, and even were here for that moment uh, 50 years ago. Uh, I talked to Mary Lynn Porter recently and she was telling me how John Jeffers called her up and said, I'd like for you to chair the deacon nominating committee uh, this year. And I think it is time uh, to be intentional about putting women on the ballot. And she talked about meeting with that committee over at the BSU uh, and how everyone on that committee wholeheartedly agreed uh, and moved forward in that direction. And we're so thankful for the faithfulness of this congregation in making that decision 50 years ago. We are also excited that Susie Painter March is here with us. Uh, Susie has been a longtime leader in Baptist life. Uh, she retired as the executive coordinator of Global CBF, the highest position in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Uh, during her tenure uh, in that position, she expanded the mission of CBF ensured much of its future, increased its diversity. Uh, she has also worked tirelessly throughout her career in so many different important ways, uh, whether that was with the Christian Life Commission in areas of religious liberty, uh, also with the Baptist World Alliance. Uh, you can't go anywhere in Baptist life where you don't miss Susie's, mention Susie's name and somebody has a wonderful story uh, to tell about her. Uh, I still remember, I've known Susie for a long time, admired her for a long time, and I remember, uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was, when uh, I was serving as the moderator of the Coordinating Council of Alabama CBF, and Terry Bird invited me to come to the, was it called the MLT? Yes, the MLT. CBF has all of these like acronyms. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what it stands for, but it was the annual meeting of all the state coordinators when they meet in Atlanta to collaborate and uh, talk about the upcoming year. And I had the chance to go with Terry that year. And I still remember sitting in that room with all the state coordinators and I think it was the year you were retiring, you were leading up to that date, and you just felt the respect and appreciation in the room from all those state coordinators and talking about Susie. And then there was one morning where she came to address the group. And I mean, you thought Elvis was about to show up. <laughs> They were all so excited and talking about a retirement and so thankful and how are we going to move forward and so grateful for all that she had done. And wherever you go in uh, not just CBF life, but Baptist life, uh, when you mention her name, that those are the sorts of stories that people tell. So Susie, we are grateful you're here and looking forward to all you have to share. You know, mentioning that reminds me so much of our work within Christian ministry 
is about what happens in the moment, things that you could never have prepared for, right? But they're given to you as just a golden opportunity to seize or to ignore. One of the things about CBF when I came was that the state and regional organizations had developed a kind of competition in the way the funding structure was set up and everything. It was just hard for people to cooperate without letting those competitive structures guide them. So sometimes the work is very unseen and very dull and pedantic. But changing those internal structures allowed for the cooperation and collaboration, which was just waiting to happen when some of those barriers were removed. So I'm, I so thank you for that story in particular because I count that camaraderie and love for each other among the states and regions to be one of the most beautiful transformations that happened at CBF and it's born fruit everywhere. So thank you for that. Let's pray. Lord, we gathered this morning so aware that you are a generous sower of seeds. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for blessing us, for giving us gifts. Forgive us for the times we don't use them, don't listen, and let the seeds fall. So bring to mind, in our feeble minds, dear Lord, your generosity and the fact that you keep giving us gifts for tomorrow that we pick them up, water them well, and nurture them for your will. In Christ's name, amen. I want, I'm so grateful to be here and so grateful to Tripp and for this lectureship to the Moors. I, I want to say that the invitation to do this and the prompting of gathering has come together in my life with great fruitfulness. And this lectureship and this invitation in part has been very central in that gathering. And I'll tell you more about that as we go. I also want to celebrate Leland Cooper. I'm just so happy that I've gotten to meet her in posterity and I feel like I know her. And um, I'm just reminded of the power of ordination, what it does to bless us. In 2010, uh, Dr. Pam Durso was then director of Baptist Women in Ministry. Now she's president of Central Seminary. And she wrote this, the earliest known ordination of a Baptist woman in ministry was in 1876. It was M.A. Brennan in Bell Vernon, Free Will Baptist Church in Pennsylvania, 1876. That was followed in 1882 by May Jones in Puget Sound, Washington, the first American Baptist woman ordained to ministry. And in 1964, many of you will remember the ordination of Addie Davis from Watts Street Baptist Church in Winston-Salem as the first Southern Baptist woman ordained to ministry. I hold that people like Leland Cooper led the way for the ordinations that have happened in ministry since. Today, in a time when others, like the Southern Baptists, are kicking out churches pastored by women, and when we see people embarrassed to talk about women in ministry at dinner parties or defend women in ministry in the most common settings. Let's remember this pioneering spirit and the call and the ministry of Leland Cooper. And let's move supporting women in ministry. Let's move it to the front of the bus. For the past three years, I've been a part of a project with 19 Baptist women in ministry to chronicle and reflect and encourage women in ministry. We've all shared our stories, and to a person, it's because we all faced barriers in ministry. As Kay Sheridan said, these women and women like them either hurdled the barriers or we just sashayed around them. <laughs> 
In the stories of these 19 women, the whisper of God's voice was an echo. It was always personal, a personal calling, but often unfolding and gaining clarity over time. To Kathy Manis Finley, from a, a young age, she grew up in a Greek Orthodox family, in Greek and just completely immersed in Greek Orthodox culture, Greek Orthodox worship, and one day inside her Greek Orthodox cathedral, sitting by herself at a recess time while at Greek school, she heard God's call. But it wasn't until later in her life when she was connected with a Baptist youth group and a Baptist college group and the freedom to express ministry that that call blossomed into a ministry of over 40 years. And how interesting that journey from one culture to another for Nancy Sehested, the she says the voices of women speaking, speaking, not preaching, right? Remember that? Or, you know, giving the mission talk, all these coded phrases we had for how women could lead but not be recognized. The voices and the examples of these women may have been mislabeled but not mistook as a call on her life to, to ministry, to pastor, and then to be a prison chaplain in the most difficult sections of the prisons for over 15 years. For Annika Tane, another friend of mine, African-American young woman in ministry now, she talks about the voices and the examples of her ancestors in learning their stories, it nurtured her call. She had a call from God. And it wasn't until she heard their stories of resilience and creativity and their ability to see through the mislabels to the truth of God's leadership that she felt this hallmark of calling so strong. This curiosity towards God with this inquisitiveness towards God, not letting go of the whisper of God in their life. But sometimes the call of God on a woman's life towards ministry will be conditional. Like Carolyn Hale Cubbage says, she voiced this to herself in childhood in these words, well, I would be a preacher when I grow up, if I were a boy, <laughs> if, if, if. So many women experience a conditional path of if. And the twin sister, if only, if only. On the way to ordination and committed ministry, the strength and resilience required to overcome the conditional path strewn with obstacles. Well, it builds a kind of musculature, right? Go, if this, and if only that, and I'll try this, and I'll... you gain a little strength along the way. Woman after woman finds herself expressing ministry through a lot of various positions, maybe not even positions of her first choice. But if only, I'll try that. Very few straight and simple paths to ministry. One of the basic questions is, can a call to ministry actually transcend the origin and the context of that call? If the call to ministry is so fraught for women, can they get past it? How do they get past it? Well, of course, the answer is a resounding yes. Yes. The call to ministry can always, always transcend the origin of that call. But not alone. It takes more. 
to move on that path. Whatever nursery births these notes of curiosity and inquisitiveness, the woman herself must be the carrier of the calling. And she will let it down if there is no more echo around her, no more support. Because often the birthplace of a call to ministry is in a place that has inherent limitations. And so those inherent limitations, we have to have catalysts to get past the inherent limitations. And that's the role, really, of both a calling to ministry and what I call a falling into ministry. Ministry is both a calling and a falling. And falling means that you fall into the arms of love and friendship and support someplace, someplace. And that soil becomes the fertile soil, abounding in friendship and collegiality of nurturing people. Of my 19 women in my circle around me sharing these stories, each of them has both a story of calling and a story of falling into the arms of some group that loved them into the fullness of their call. Rhonda Blevins, Julie Long, Lynn Brinkley, they all talk about the experience of finding ministry <laughs> that began with kind of a love affair of an immersion in a youth group or a college group or a group that was on a trip, a mission trip someplace and kept their bonds together. So in my circle of 19 women, I want to bring Leland and set her down and make her the 20th chair. Bring her into the circle. She was baptized in the fall of 1900, right? As a teen, having presented herself for membership at this very church. The church ministry included Sunbeams, Young Ladies Missionary Society, the Willing Workers, I'd like to know that group, and the Baptist Young People's Union. They were for Leland Cooper at the birth of her call. I think she must have been nurtured by these groups. They were her falling. They were the people that came around her. So in 1919, when she's tapped are probably more likely allowed to take the Baptist Young People's Union and lead it into becoming the first Baptist Student Union at Auburn. It was monumental. It was monumental. Historically, in 1919, the fundamentalist movements were rampant in the United States and in Baptist life. They were repressing women, and they were repressing many, many freedoms. And the polarized political scandals of that day fractured Baptist life. But her church, this church, somewhere there had been enough falling into these groups of love and support that this church was the nurturing hub for her life in ministry, her very unusual and risky life in ministry. A hub from which a lifetime of ministry would not just grow for a season, but it would flourish for generations right? and lead fruit. Resiliency, resiliency is contextual in all these stories. The dream and the lived calling is always shaped by the very geographical context. The church, the groups, the friends, the people that don't turn their back on you when you're the only one. Baptistness is a theme. 
in each of these 20 stories. What did it take to ride that surfboard of Baptistness through her life? Leland Cooper certainly saw Baptist identity change and morph and become and divide. Whether it's one woman saying, well, I'm no longer this kind of Baptist, but another, or another one in the circle saying, well, I used to be a Baptist, but now I'm a minister and name a denomination. I call that the Baptist Alumni Society. <laughs> we have it so often. One of my favorite things about my experience in Baptist life is getting to work with other denominations and in the basically in the ecumenical and interfaith world, and so often in a gathering of Methodists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, uh, UCC people, oh, yes, I was a Baptist. <laughs> I knew how to study the Bible, and I brought that to <laughs> I love it. But these great lessons of identity and affiliation are claimed by women. Our ministerial identities are shaped by our communities and our churches. And this resiliency leaves us open to opportunity. But opportunity, hmm, that's a two-edged sword. And the very identification of what's known as opportunities in ministry is tricky for women in ministry. Heeding Rhonda Blevins' sage advice to please be careful, she says, we are cautioned not to be so hungry for an opportunity that we paint the red flags with green paint and only discover later that those weren't green flags at all. And several women in ministry have crashed and burned on their hopes of a great opportunity that they did not discern honestly because of their desire to serve. One of the great tragedies in ministry, the very desire for an opportunity can lead us to deceive ourselves. We just want it to be true so bad. Jill Hudson, who leads Texas Baptist Women in Ministry, recounts her preparation in seminary and her experience in ministry. Uh, she came to that preparation in, in seminary after already having a very successful teaching career, but being called to be prepared for ministry. She earnestly pursued her seminary path, and after three years of hard study for her MDiv, she was hungry for opportunities to be interviewed for ministry positions but she had very few opportunities to interview authentically. This is compared to her husband, who was showered with interview opportunities, even though he only took seminary classes because she was in seminary and he had come along with her and he just kind of took them out of convenience. And there she was with her heart's desire and he's the one with the dance card full of partners. Her dedication and deep commitment was not recognized, nor did it bear fruit in our, quote, Baptist system. But she's still a Baptist. In this circle, beyond those disappointments, there are powerful and memorable and precious moments of yes, these affirmations and callings by congregations, they may not come easily or often. But Carolyn Hale Covich, she has the joy of learning. She said that the deacons had unanimously recommended me. Unanimously, unanimously, she said. And she celebrated that word as if it were the greatest prize attainable. That blessing, the power to bless, unanimous, is a blessing. 
It's the wind and the weary sails of many in ministry. And I love the, um, just the reflection of Christine Wiley. She's a legendary long-term African-American minister. She served in the same church as pastor for 37 years. But she says, you know, although I've been in the same place geographically, my church has actually been more than one church over all those years. It's changed with the winds of the Spirit. And to be blessed again and again and again, she says, oh, it's made me so happy in ministry. I'm struck that some of these stories come from a woman who's exhibiting gifts of leadership as a highly proficient administrative or executive leader. It's often the case for women that their path to ministry will take them through another career before ministry. A pattern not so common in men's ministry, but very common in women's ministry. They were a teacher first, or they were a, a real estate agent first, or they owned a small business first. Mm -hmm. You see this happening a lot for women in ministry. Like Lynn Brinkley, many of you may know her. She journeyed. She was a very accomplished law enforcement officer and administrator before coming to hear her call and seek her place in ministry. And Carol Staley, many of you may know her from Arkansas. She was a renowned opera star. And then she was tapped by her childhood friend, Bill Clinton, to come to Washington, D.C. and serve in his administration, where she took on the role of international literacy and served in the United States and in two countries in Africa. Great accolades given for the superlative work and soaring accomplishments that only prepared them for ministry. I heard God's call to ministry myself long before my imagination could vaguely see me as an executive for state or national or international missions and denominational work. I never imagined myself as the CEO of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship or the director of the Texas Baptist Christian Life Commission of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. That's not to say I didn't see myself, this little old lady, as a CEO. I did. I just didn't think it'd be in church. <laughs> I, I could imagine myself in those secular positions. But God worked on me with a call. At the same time, God was preparing me for some way to step into ministry. His imagination was ahead of mine. When I was an adjunct teacher at Baylor in the College of Education, the dean called me in. We had a problem, he said. There's a powerful state senator who has a bill down at the state capitol in Austin, Texas, and it will shut down all the colleges of education. And I was teaching reading in the College of Education at Baylor. The state schools can't lobby for it, he said, because they receive state money. So it's fallen to the private schools, that's SMU and TCU and Baylor and Texas Lutheran, to kill this bill. And the deans, we've been down there, but this state senator won't see us, and we think you should go. Literally, I've got to tell you, I was in his office and I looked over my shoulder like, is there somebody else in here? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, aren't you president of the Reading Teachers Association? Yes, I said, not knowing that wasn't going to be my answer to a call from God. Yes, I'm president of the Reading Teachers Association. Well, we figure you know lots more teachers than we do, and so we're going to send you down there, but don't worry, we've got a consultant. 
He'll help you. <laughs> so I went down to Austin and I met with the consultant. He asked me several questions. First of all, he said, how much have your reading teachers given to the campaigns of these 16 people that serve on this committee? Well, you know the answer to that, zero, you know. Okay, he said, how many op-eds have y'all written on this subject? Zero. <laughs> he said, okay, how many of these 16 legislators that sit on this committee do you know personally? You know the answer to that? Zero. <laughs> And he stood up from that table, and he looked down at me, and very sarcastically, he said, Well, what do you have? And he walked away. I felt insulted. I felt like a total failure. I felt so anxious to come back and tell the dean <laughs> and let him down. But right in the middle of all those thorny feelings, something happened with God. God put a scripture in my head. At that moment, it was like he went through all these emotional weeds and planted something firm and steady right there. And it wasn't the... Uh, notification of a scripture, not like John 3.16. It was the picture from scripture. It was right there. It was seared into my consciousness. I was that kid with the basket, loaves and fishes, and some arrogant disciples standing over me looking at it saying, well, what do you have? And I got past my feelings of inadequacy and had to admit that was actually the right question. What did I have? Well, I knew teachers in 254 counties in Texas. And God gave me a brilliant idea. There's only 16 people on the committee, he said. Go find their first grade teacher. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> there were 17 people in that joint committee, eight from the House, eight from the Senate, and this powerful committee chair. It was his pet bill. But we found the actual first grade teacher. You know, it's public record. We found the actual first grade teacher of all 16 people. And we call her up and we say, okay, here's what's wrong with the bill. Here's the bad thing. She, I got it, she said. Senator so-and-so, this is Mrs. Such-and-Such. And I was your first grade teacher. <laughs> Can I come see you? And to a person, they said, is such and such. I can't wait to see you. Come on. And then just like a little uh, battalion of Trojan horses, they went to the table. <laughs> oh, it was something. They explained why the bill should be killed and how colleges of education is where you are taught how to teach reading. And if you don't know how to teach reading, well, you wouldn't be here as a senator today, you know. So that was it. But you know, with uh, legislators, you never know till it's the day of the vote, correct? So, I went to the hearing, and the chairman laid out his bill, and the committee clerk called for a vote, and the first committee member on the left uh, voted no, and the second committee member voted no. And the third committee member voted no. And by about the time we were at the fifth committee member, the chairman, you could see he was turning red. He was really upset. He was going to lose his bill in his own committee. This is not the sign of a powerful legislator. And so he grabs the gavel, and he's shaking with anger, and he starts pounding it, and he says, this committee's adjourned right now before they got to the seventh vote. 
And he said, this committee is adjourned. None of you will get any of your bills out of this committee until you pass my bill. And he strides out of the committee room with the gavel in his hand and disappears. You know, I got to tell you, I did not know how to interpret that moment. But there was a tap on my shoulder, and it was that consultant. And he said, oh, my gosh, you won. <laughs> and he said, and you better get out of here. <laughs> About 11 p.m. that night, back in Waco, my phone rang. It was a very inebriated Senator Carl Parker. <laughs> and he said, who in the blank are you? And I said, I'm nobody. I'm just a reading teacher. But I can fix your bill. Because he wanted to pass it more than he wanted to keep it together. He said, well, can you be in my office at 830 in the morning? And I said, yes, sir. And I drove back and gave him the wording to substitute in his bill that allowed the bill to pass. But it saved the colleges of education. And it prescribed in that language the certification for all elementary school teachers in the state of Texas. And it said they had to have an interdisciplinary major, including reading, from colleges of education, and that language still stands today and is the way all elementary teachers are certified. Now, I'd say that's harvest 30, 60, 100 fold. But not only did that impact teachers and education, it generated a call to ministry to serve others, to advocate for others, to learn how to do this on behalf of the people of God. In my heart, the streams of love for God's people and my secularly honed skills merged when I was invited by my dear friend, Phil Strickland, a dear friend that Livy and I shared in our lives friend and mentor, and he invited me to be the lobbyist for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. I believed that God could use whatever gifts I gave over to the mysterious power of the Holy Spirit. It was as if I was giving the most mundane and dutiful of skills. Add a track a bill, find a teacher, Make a visit. I said to God, can you really make something of this? But what transformed my skills to ministry was turning my love for God's people into these actions of advocacy. I, I mean, for, I legislated and worked for women in prison who at that point in Texas did not receive women's clothing when they were incarcerated. They had men's shoes and men's clothing and men's undergarments instead of women's undergarments. Adding hospitality houses at the prisons for traveling families of the incarcerated. Adding chaplains to state prisons. The unsacramental tasks of lawmaking were developing into ministry. We worked years to bring a life without parole sentence to the state with the highest death sentence rate in the free world. 100 people were being put to death every year in Texas until one of our interns from the Christian Life Commission told the story of the murder of his childhood friend to more than 200 legislators. And this bill passed life without parole. Now, four people on average are put to death in Texas per year. Drafting, amending, persuading legislation is essentially dull work until the work is ignited by love. I was working to add compassionate services to foster care, lobbying for immigrants, seeking asylum, getting college tuition adjusted 
throughout our state. I was fighting to tighten the accountability loophole for predatory lenders who seem to be able to take people's money in thousands of ways and at interest rates over 500%. I worked for church-state separation, and in my own ministry journey, I took these pedantic gifts, and God ignited them to sear my heart and catapult me as a voice on behalf of suffering. I mean, I got to tell you, it was just a meager handful that I gave to God. But it was harvest a hundredfold. Who knew the thick skin <laughs> and the, the thick skin I developed and the seasoned skills I learned wrangling with Texas legislators would be all teed up for the denominational struggles ahead. <laughs> But they were. They were. How do you handle conflict and not be destroyed? How do you know you're sinner and not be compromised? What a great privilege to lead the Christian Life Commission, to lead CBF, to develop missions and ministries in 30 countries around the world, to be at the Baptist World Alliance, to speak into the governments in China, in India, in places of real persecution, and not be afraid. For each of the women in this circle, their ministry roles have changed and been shaped by God. I, I wish Leland Cooper could see us today and know that her ministry at BSU and her ordination to the diaconate 50 years ago have shaped this present landscape of ministry. I'm reminded of Hildegard of Bingen, a saintly mother of the early church who lived in the 1100s. She was an anchorite and was locked in a cell with a, uh, a nun for many years. And when she was released from that, when the nun died, because she was the nun's servant, she went outside for the first time in her life, in her conscious life, at 11, to see and be in creation. And she said this, we cannot live in a world that's not our own, in a world that's interpreted for us only by others. An interpreted world is not a home. Part of the terror is to take back our own listening to God and to use our own voice to see our own light. What catalyst expands ministry? What fertilizer makes it grow and bloom? And what fruit abounds and will abound in the days yet to come? As a congregation, it is a season to support women and be intentional. Women can't do it alone. How can you help to build a bridge to strengthen other people's ministry when your own bridge and your own foundation is so fragile. They need their congregations. They need these arms to fall into and support them, encourage them. One striking similarity and thread throughout the stories are the willingness of women to share and that certainly includes Leland Cooper, who shared so generously true faith in fertility and abundance. She had faith in the fertility and abundance of her ministry. She did not wait for some outside assurance of it. While her circumstance and many women in ministries, circumstance does not provide largesse. I mean, there's no stately barns of wealth, right, in this uh, endeavor. 
these women are giving seed and tending growth and reaping harvest. So many women giving to other women, not from a stock of what's extra, but from this little stream of grace that bubbles up within them from this precious, small stream generating from within our own ministries, real-time sharing with no assurance that there'll be enough for me, but giving away anyway. There's genuine hope in that that vessel will be refilled, pressed down, shaken up, and overflowing measure for measure. Amen. I'm happy to take some questions about women in ministry, about our group. And let me say this, this book has come out of that circle of 19 women. So that's why I say I'm so grateful for this invitation and for the opportunity to focus on and learn from and cultivate these wonderful stories of ministry. It's called When God Whispered My Name, and it's stories of a journey told by Baptist women in ministry. Um, I also want to just hold up and, and show the Baptist women in ministry uh, strategic plan. There is a strategic plan. Uh, this wonderful organization led by Meredith Stone uh, is something that is has been growing and evolving as a mature organization. And, and I, I'll say more about Leland in my sermon today, but I was so impressed with her capacity of building organizations. Uh, there is great fruitfulness in that, and I see the Baptist Women in Ministry as one of those organizations that is helping, helping to strengthen ministry around our, our country. Are there any uh, questions or comments? All right. I want to thank you for the best breakfast I've had in uh, <laughs> at least a year. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you so much, Tripp.